Okay, we've been talking about hypothesis testing now for several meetings, talking about uh, hypothesis testing using z-tests or using a z-test as our departure point, um, and we've now moved to uh, the use of t-testing uh, that is appropriate when sample size is small. And what I want to do uh, this morning is go over another couple of examples of uh, t-testing. I'm concerned, uh, I'm interested that you understand the process of hypothesis testing and then obviously at some lower level the mechanics of, in this instance, t-testing. As I've indicated I think several times, hypothesis testing is a three-step process. The first step involves deriving the critical value of the test statistic, whether that test statistic is Z or T, or as we will come to see in, the, in analysis of variance, an F statistic. The second, process, the second step in the process is to compute some critical value or some observed or attained value rather of that test statistic. And the third step is then to use those two scores to evaluate the null hypothesis. And while I'm confident that you can, if you memorize the formula, compute an obtained value of the test statistic, whether it be Z or T, I'm not altogether convinced that all of you can proceed effectively through the other two steps. And, and having said that, I would encourage you, if you have questions, if there are areas of this process, steps in this process, that you are not clear about, then you should indicate that. And we should clarify the issue now rather than when you get to, to an exam. Are there any questions to begin with? If not, let's proceed to a, uh, another example where t-testing is, is, is appropriate. Let's understand, first of all, as well, that there is a need, a primary need, to determine the critical value of the test statistic here, t and that we need three pieces of information. We need to know whether the test is one or two-tailed. We need, secondly, to know the level of alpha. And third, we need to know the degrees of freedom. Let's, let me go through, read through an example. A researcher predicts that male members of an organization earn significantly more than female members. Let me ask you, just based upon that piece of information, what is the research hypothesis? What does the researcher predict will be the relationship between the average income of males and the average income of females? The prediction, would you agree, of the researcher is that X bar M, that is the average, theme, the average male salary, will exceed X bar F, that is the average female salary. So that the null hypothesis is that 
x bar m will be less than or equal to x bar f. Yes. Given this piece of information, that is, given the research hypothesis, should the test be one-tailed or two-tailed? The test should be one-tailed. Because you're not being called upon to test simply for difference. Because of the nature of the research hypothesis, you do not have to test for the possibility that the average income of males will be less than the average income of females. You need to test only for positive difference in this instance so that the test, the appropriate test, is one tiled. In order to test this hypothesis, the researcher measures the annual income of 32 selected members of the organization. 17 of the members are male. So if we go to the group of males, N1 equals 17. The mean income of these males is 29,324 dollars a year. That is X bar 1 equals 29,324. And the standard deviation of these scores is 1,743. That is S1 equals 1,743. 15 members of the sample are female. That is N2 equals 15. The average income of the 15, annual income of the 15 females is $28,191. And the standard deviation of those income scores is $3,325. Just as an aside, you understand that these standard deviation scores indicate that there's more variance in the female scores than in the male scores. Yeah? Let's set alpha equal to 0.05. Given sample size, how many degrees of freedom are there? The degrees of freedom are given by N1 minus 1 plus N2 minus 1, which in this case is 17 minus 1, which is 16, plus 15 minus 1, which is 14, so that there are 30 degrees of freedom, would you agree? Given those pieces of information, what is the critical value of T? I've given you another uh, table of T values. And let's just go through using this table of t-values because I think it's significantly more user-friendly. Down the extreme left-hand side, as is always the case, you have degrees of freedom. Across the top, you have level of significance for a one-tailed test and then there are various levels of alpha going from 0.0005 to 0.10. You then have level of significance for a two-tailed test with a series of alpha values going from 0.001 to 0.20. Would you agree that we're conducting a one-tailed test here with alpha equal to 0.05 so that our interest is in the column of scores headed 6.314? Yes or no? Yes? There are 30 degrees of freedom. So we go down that column until we reach 30 degrees of freedom. 
Would you agree then that the critical T-score, T-value in this test is plus 1.697? You've now got one question right on the exam. Because on the exam, you will be asked to identify the critical value, the obtained value, and then evaluate the null hypothesis. So there will be sets of three questions. You've now got one question right. You're doing well. Everything is everything. Yes. Everything is not everything. If it is a two-tailed test, then we divide alpha by two then? What you would do with this table is you would simply go to level of significance for two-tailed tests. And if the alpha level for this test was 0.05, you would be interested in the column of figures headed 12.706. And with 30 degrees of freedom, the critical T value would be plus 2.042. It would actually be plus and minus 2.042 if it were a two-tailed test. Are there any other questions? We need now then to uh, determine or to compute the obtained or the observed value of the test statistic T. And we do that by invoking the only computational formula that we've encountered so far, and that is x bar 1 minus x bar 2 divided by the square root of S1 squared divided by N1 minus 1 plus S2 squared divided by N2 minus 1, which is 29,324 minus 28,191 divided by the square root of 1,743 squared divided by 16 plus 3,325 squared divided by 14. Yes? We're all, going to, we're all going to plug and chug. We now take this time out for plugging and chugging. 1,743 squared divided by 16 plus 3,325 squared divided by 14 equals should be something like 97,950 rather, rather 979,565 and you want the square root of that which should be something like 989.7 You now want to divide that into the difference between the means. The difference between the means is eleven hundred and thirty three. What is your answer? Pardon? 4.34 we go for? No? The rest of you didn't do it. I, I, I Nothing like dead air. What does anybody get here? Because 
I can, I can tell you what I get. After we get the square root of the 989, where do we go from there? In terms of calculating this, What you have to do is divide the square root of that score into the difference between the two means. Now, you can, you, can, you can do that in several ways in terms of plugging and chugging. You can, at that point, take the square root of this score and write it down. And then you can subtract one mean, x bar 2, from x bar 1. And then you can divide by and then the score that you wrote down for the denominator. Alternatively, when you have computed this, the denominator, your calculator, because mine has, my calculator is 412 years old, your calculator should have a key on it that says 1 over x. If you hit if if you hit this button, it will invert this this denominator. And so, rather than take the score out of the calculator, you can then multiply it by the difference between the two means. I, I've said previously that the plugging and chugging at some level is not important, and it's not. Preliminarily, it's not important. It's much more important that you understand the process. But plugging and chugging on the exam is going to, and doing it right is going to be important because you either get the answer correct or you get it incorrect. So, I'd like you to get some rehearsal at that by working your way through, through some of these examples as we go along. What answer... Those of you who computed the obtained value of T, what answer did you get? And it doesn't matter. There's no embarrassment here if you got it wrong. I may well have got it wrong. Pardon? 1 1.12, 4.34, 1.14, 1.14. I got 1.14. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't matter whether you, at, at some level, it doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong. Yeah. It's important that you understand and ultimately memorize this formula. And it doesn't matter how you plug and chug your way through the formula. I don't care whether you're taking scores out of your calculator and writing them down or whether you're proceeding some other way. This is not a course in how to use, best use your calculator. You progress through the plugging and chugging in the way that makes you feel most comfortable. The way in which you believe the probability is highest that you will come out with the correct answer. Let's assume that the correct answer in this case is plus 1.14. And I apologize for my writing, but it's a function of where they've got the keys on this because it's for right-handed people. I will say again with some animosity in my voice. Dell and the rest of these people ought to provide some sensitivity to left-handed people. If Michael Dell were left-handed, I suspect we would have a different computer. So, what do you do? We've gone through step one, defining the critical value of T. We've gone through step two, computing the obtained value of T. Now it's a matter of evaluating the null hypothesis. Would you conclude, I that males earn significantly more than females, B, there is no significant difference between the annual income of males and females, 
Or would you conclude C, that females probably get a free ride in this organisation anyway because they're not called upon to do anything that's at all cognitively substantive. I'm just joking for the females that now have the... There's, there's a hit man, hit woman in here somewhere. We would conclude, first of all, that women are underpaid because they're obviously working substantially harder in this organisation than males. The issue here is, would you reject the null hypothesis and conclude that males earn significantly more than females or would you fail to reject the null hypothesis and conclude there is no significant difference between the annual incomes of males and females? All those who would reject the null hypothesis, just stick up your hand. All those that would fail to reject the null hypothesis, all those that are unsure. Okay. Let's go back to a sampling distribution of sample mean differences. A sampling distribution approaches normality even if the population is not distributed normally. Because we're talking about the sampling distribution of sample mean differences, the center of this distribution, mu, is equal to zero. That is where x bar 1 equals x bar 2. You understand as you move away from the center of this distribution, either in a positive or a negative direction, the differences depart from zero. The differences between x bar 1 and x bar 2 depart from zero. Initially, they depart minimally from zero. But at the extremes, there is pronounced difference between x bar 1 and x bar 2. Either pronounced negative difference or pronounced positive difference. We could replace the word pronounced by significant difference. We drew a line in the sand. That is, we said at some point we're going to conc up until some point, we're going to conclude that the difference between these two scores is not significant. Beyond that point, we're going to con conclude that it is significant. And that point is the critical value of T. That is, 1.697 standard deviations above the mean. In order for you and I to reject the null hypothesis and conclude significant difference, the obtained or observed value of T must be in this shaded region. If it is not in this shaded region, that is, if it's in this striped region, you and I, given the rule that we, rules that we set up, would conclude that there is no significant difference between the annual income of males and the annual income of females in this organization. The obtained value of T was 1.14, somewhere in here. We agreed that we would reject the null hypothesis only if the obtained value was in this shaded region. Would you all agree then that given the rule that we set up, the decision-making rule that we established at the outset, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis? And when we fail to reject the null hypothesis, we would conclude that there is no significant difference 
between the annual income of males and females in this particular organization. Several of you said that you would reject the null hypothesis and several more said that they were unsure how to make this decision. Would you still make the deci same decision if you, re if you were one of those who rejected the null hypothesis? And are you as unsure as you were before if you were one of those who said, I'm unsure what to do? We got another example of this to go through. I can, I can make these up from now until Christmas. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> we could play tea testing. That's what you do over, th over the break. You meet up with your parents and you play a game of tea testing. I bet you do better than your parents in most instances. Not because you won't do it correct, but I'm assuming that in some instances your parents will be able to do this too. See, I'm figuring all you will be, each of you will be able to do it. Okay, sports fans, we're on the road again. We're on the road again. I just can't wait to get on the road again. <laughs> Passing my time singing Willie Nelson songs. Badly. A researcher predicts that married males watch significantly more television than unmarried males. We know this is true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Married Miles, once, once they're married, man, we just sit down in front of that TV and suck it up. 24 hours a day. We'll watch nature shows. We'll watch sports events. We'll watch competitions between animals. Two rabbits racing, two rabbits fighting, three rabbits fighting. That would be even better. <laughs> we'll watch shows about people with a 165-pound tumor on their back. Yeah, wasn't that freaky? It's just freaky. It's just freaky. You see a woman who weighs 138 pounds and she's got a carrying toting around a 165 pound tumor on her back. It's not good. Things are not good. The good news is she, the tumor was removed and she lived a normal and happy life in Romania. She was not really Romanian. We just sent her to Romania afterwards to bring hope to the Romanian. No, she was Romanian. So, a researcher predicts imaginatively that married males watch significantly more television than unmarried males. Should the test be one or two tiled? If you didn't answer one tiled, First of all, you're incorrect, and secondly, you're, second, you're, you, it's getting to a point where you're in trouble. The research, if, had the researchers simply predicted that the amount of television watched by married and unmarried males differs, it would have been a two-tailed test. Had the researcher predict, predicted that unmarried males watch more TV than married males, the test would have been one-tailed, because it predicts not simply difference, but difference in a particular direction. And so too does the researcher here, predicting that unmarried males, as rather married males, watch more TV 
than unmarried males. So that if group one is a group of married males and group two is a group of unmarried males, then the research hypothesis is that X bar one will be greater than X bar two. You have simply the need to then to test for positive difference. That is, you need to test only one tail of this, this, of this sampling distribution of sample mean differences. So that the test should be one tail. In order to test this hypothesis, the researcher measures the amount of television viewed by 122 randomly selected males. 62 are married, that is N1 equals 62. And 60 are unmarried, N2 equals 60. When the researcher tests the hypothesis, the researcher tests the hypothesis with alpha set to 0.05. We need to know three pieces of information to decide the critical value of T. We need to know whether the test is one or two tailed. We need to know the level of alpha and we need to know the number of degrees of freedom. How many degrees of freedom are there here? Would, would you all agree that the degrees of freedom here are 120? N1 minus 1 plus N2 minus 1, which is 61 plus 59, which is 120. We now use the T table. The first thing we look for is level of significance for, two for a two-tailed test. With alpha e a one-tailed test with alpha equal to 0.05. Would you agree that we are interested in the column of scores headed 6.314? With 120 degrees of freedom, would you agree that the critical value of T is plus 1.658. We need now to compute an obtained value of T. And to do that we need to know X bar 1 and S1 and we need to know X bar 2 and S2. That is the mean and standard deviation of the two sets of scores. Let's assume that the average amount of television viewing by the 62 married males is 4.21 hours per day. And that the standard deviation of those scores is 1.88. Let's imagine that the mean amount of telev television viewing by the 60 unmarried males is 2.26 hours a day and that the standard deviation of those scores is 1.43. We then compute an obtained value of T by invoking the formula X bar 1, 4.21 minus X bar 2, 2.26 divided by the square root of S1 squared, which is 1.88 squared, divided by N1 minus 1, which is 61, plus S2 squared, which is 1.43 squared, divided by N2 minus 1, which is 59. Are there, is anybody unclear on how we got to this point computationally. Then we enter into a moment's silence for the plugging and the chugging.
this is going to drive subsequent students nuts, you know that? But they should be plugging and chugging along with us. So, sports fans, what do you have? What are you saying to me? Do I hear 1.6? Do I hear 2.0? Do I hear anybody say you go along with 6.4, 6.41, one of those two, I'd say 6.41. I'd say that the obtained value is 6.41. Actually, 6.408. Oh, eight, seven. So, we have reached, as you would say in your culture, the point where the rubber hits the road. We have reached the bottom line. Something has hit the fan. We have, uh, we have reached the point of decision. Do you reject the null hypothesis or do you fail to reject the null hypothesis? Oh, it's like a choir. It's like a choir singing in harmony. We reject the null hypothesis. We're going to take it out and kill it. You reject the null hypothesis because the obtained value of T is in, if you go back to the graphic representation of this, of the sampling distribution of sample means, any obtained value of T in excess of 1.658 was going to be reason for us to reject the null hypothesis. We have an observed value in it of six point plus 6.41. We therefore reject the null hypothesis. We conclude that in fact married males watch significantly more television than unmarried males. Are there any questions about about initially about going from statements of we reject the null hypothesis to the statement that casts that in terms of the issue. That is, when you reject the null hypothesis in this instance, what you conclude is that m married males watch significantly more television than unmarried males. Are there any questions at all? Yes. Would you would you like to press and? Um, since we have a more detailed table of T, we don't have to um, divide alpha by two anymore, even if it's a two-cell test. Or the uh, T table that I distributed, I think, is significantly more user-friendly because it distinguishes between one and two tailed tests. So that if you are conducting a one tailed test, you simply locate the appropriate alpha value 
under level of significance for a one-tailed test. So if alpha is 0.05, it's a one-tailed test, you're interested in the column of scores headed 6.314. You don't have to divide anything by two. If you are conducting a two-tailed test and alpha is 0.05, you're interested in the column of scores headed 12.706. To allay another potential concern, this t-table, like any t-table in any text, is limited. It contains no degrees of freedom, for example, between 30 and 40. It contains no degrees of freedom between 40 and 60 or 60 and 120. And it contains no degrees of freedom in excess of 120. And one, que one question that that may lead to is what happens on an exam if we've got 64 degrees of freedom? If you compute degree, my answer, if you compute the degrees of freedom and you've got 64, you're wrong. <laughs> or I have made a mistake in typing up the exam. On the exam, the degrees of freedom that you need will be one of the values on here. Okay. Yes. How would we uh, evaluate the no hypothesis on a two-tailed um, on a two-tailed test? Suppose in this instance we had the researcher had predicted simply that married and unmarried males watch different amounts of TV. That test would have been two-tailed. Would you agree? That is, we would now be dealing with a two-tailed test rather than a one-tailed test. But nothing else would change. That is, we could retain alpha at 0 0.05 and the degrees of freedom would still be 120. But what would change would be the critical value of T. And the critical value, to determine the critical value of T, we would go to uh, the T table that I distributed level of significance for a two-tailed test with alpha equal to 0.05. You're interested in the column of scores headed 12.706. Because you have 120 degrees of freedom, the critical T value, would you agree, is plus and minus 1.98. Yes? The decision rule that you've set up now, if we go back to the sampling distribution of sample mean differences, because you're testing for both positive and negative difference, you have to test both tiles, that is two tiles of the distribution. You need to define, operationalize, what constitutes alpha equal to 0.05 in a two-tailed test. And we've done that. We have to go out 1.98 standard deviations in each direction so that we isolate 0.025 of all of the scores at this end of the sampling distribution and 0.025 of all the scores at the positive end of the distribution so that the overall alpha is 0.025 plus 0.025 which is 0.05 which is what we said here. Yeah. So minus 1.98 plus 1.98. This means that we will now reject the null hypothesis if on the one hand the obtained value of T is less than 1.98, that is it's in this shaded region at the negative end of the distribution, 
or if the obtained T value is greater than plus 1.98. That is, it's in this shaded region at the positive end of the distribution. Would you agree that changing the test from one to two tiles doesn't affect the obtained value of T? We have an obtained value of T of 6.41 which is, that is, a score that's six point, a different score that is 6.41 standard deviations above the mean. Would you all agree that we would continue to reject the null hypothesis? And we would conclude in this instance that there was a significant difference because that's what we were testing for, difference, not more than, not less than we would conclude that there was a statistically significant difference between the average amount of television viewed by married and unmarried males. That there, that there is a difference. What was that hypothesis for the two-tailed again? The, hypo the research hypothesis for a two-tailed test would be that X bar 1 differs from X bar 2. No. There's always the notion of differ significantly. It's, this is the critical issue in determining one or two tiles. If the research hypothesis is simply one of difference, then you have to test for both negative difference and you have to test for positive difference. That is, you have to test both tiles of the distribution so that the appropriate test is two-tiled. If, however, you predict, the researcher predicts only negative difference, then the appropriate test is one-tiled because the only burden on the researcher is to test for negative difference. If the researcher predicts positive difference and only positive difference, then the appropriate test is one tiled because all the researcher has to do is test for positive difference. That is, test one tile of the, the sampling distribution of sample mean differences. Your question is, so the question is who watches more? If the test is too tiled, the, 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 no. The question is not who watches more. The question is either is there a significant difference between the amount of TV watched by the two groups or do the unmarried males watch significantly more TV than the married males? Or, the unmarried males. Or it's do the, do the married miles watch significantly less TV than the unmarried miles? You, you could, you've, only, you've got three options for a research hypothesis. Option one is X bar one differs from X bar two. Do married and unmarried miles watch significantly different levels, amounts of television? Two tiled. X bar one is greater than X bar two. Married males watch significantly more TV than unmarried males. One tiled. Option three, X bar one is significantly less than X bar two. That is, married males watch significantly less TV. Married males watch significantly less TV than unmarried males one tile test because in this instance in the first instance you have to test for positive and negative difference in the second instance you have to test only for positive difference and in the third instance you have to test only for negative difference so the determination of whether the test should be one or two tiled is in the research hypothesis what the researcher predicts Are there any other questions?
look over your notes. We will go through one more example of t-tests on uh, at a, when we next meet. Well, it, it <laughs> when we next meet, and um, we will also go through scenarios general scenarios so that hang on a second I know this is leave taking behaviour I study interpersonal communication I know this stuff um, we will also go through a number of scenarios so that you can get used to determining whether you need to perform a Z test or a, or a T test and then we will move into analysis of variance analysis of variance is a statistical, a data analytic technique used when you're dealing with more than two groups. And you should read ahead because this becomes, obviously, the more balls you have in the air, the more complicated this becomes. However, you're always going through the same process and ultimately you're asking the question, does this group differ from this group? read through the chapter that deals with analysis of variance or the pages that I pointed to in the text and don't stop. If you become totally confused, read on. Yeah. Get to the end of the chapter, go and pour yourself a glass of tequila, <laughs> drink the tequila and then go back to the beginning of the chapter again. It will appear so much easier. I will see you next time.